Hello, and welcome to the Social Psychic Radio Show, featuring Jason Zook. In uncertain times, we must change our focus and priorities. This show will highlight social justice issues with the goal of expanding minds and increasing unity, love, and mutual respect for ourselves and our planet. We support the Black Lives Matter movement. Our show aspires to promote social spirituality, which simply means that by coming together, we can solve any of our problems, including the goal of bringing an end to all forms of hate, discrimination, bias, or oppression. We must protect our environment, reform our criminal justice system, and protect every citizen from police brutality. When we come together, it becomes possible to bridge the gaps that plague our society and divide us from within. We the people means everyone. Hello and welcome to the Social Psychic Radio Show. This is Jason Zook. It's a great pleasure I have the opportunity of presenting special guest Kimberly Masco to the show today. Kimberly is a spiritual business coach. Having spent years in the corporate world in a job that sucked her soul dry, Kimberly Masca has now made it her passion and purpose to help spiritual coaches create a prosperous life with their spiritual gifts. Known as an enlightened business master, Kimberly uses her 20 years of business development experience, including eight years on Wall Street, to show spiritual coaches how to shift their vibration around money so that they can have the energy of exchange of love and money for their gifts. It is her sole purpose to help 5,000 spiritual entrepreneurs step into their new role as a spiritual leader in the next five years. You can discover more about Kimberly in one of her two international best-selling books, Are You a Spiritual Entrepreneur? and Chaos, A Wake-Up Call for Lightworkers. It's a great pleasure. I welcome Kimberly to the show. Welcome to the show, Kimberly. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you on. I'm excited to talk to you today because... First off, I know our audience is going to ask, what is a spiritual entrepreneur, I should say? Yes, a spiritual entrepreneur. So basically, it's, it's a term I've coined, but it's really about anyone who wants to shift consciousness on the planet, especially nowadays. We're so in need of people to awaken and have an awareness and to ha- raise their consciousness in a way that can help with everything that's going on during this time of the Great Awakening. Showing people how to take their spiritual gifts, whatever that might be, or just the idea that they're gonna help someone shift their consciousness and create an actual business around it. So they're living their purpose. They're in charge of their own income. So they're not giving that up to some corporation or something like that. And then they can actually be excited that they're serving and, and doing what they're supposed to be doing on the planet. Excellent. I want to talk about your background a little bit. How did you get into being a spiritual entrepreneur yourself and working with spiritual entrepreneurs? It was a long road. I wish it had been quicker, (laughs) as we all do. We're like, what's our purpose? Because I worked in the corporate world and did the whole Wall Street thing, which was interesting and fun. I wouldn't trade it for anything, but it was just it was at some point, like my hair was like falling out in chunks and I wasn't sleeping, eating too much, drinking too much. It was just not a good space. And so I made the decision very painfully to leave. And and the reason why it was so painful because I had created a firm, the eight other partners, and we took it from nothing, from sitting in the living room to a $165 million company. And so, thank you. Yeah, it was crazy. And so it was fun and crazy, but it was like you birthed this company and now you're going to leave. But I just, I couldn't do it anymore. And so I remember so clearly making the decision to leave. Then of course, fear set in. And it took me six months to actually tell them I was leaving. That six months cost me about $3 million waiting because I didn't listen to my inspiration from source. I didn't take inspired action, but I eventually got the nerve to do it. And then honestly, it took me a while. I'd love to say like, I left corporate and found my purpose, but I did not. It took me maybe like five or six years of bouncing around. And then it kind of came full circle. And I had always been very intuitive and knew things before they were going to happen. My mom was an amazing healer. Finally, one day I was going through my next level of awakening. And so I was tapping into all these gifts and watching all these other people with these gifts. And I'm like, why are you not doing this for a living? And and all the spiritual people go, well, I don't know how to create a business, (laughs) but it's really easy. And they're like, no, it's not. And I've actually learned that one of my intuitive gifts is actually to see someone's business. I can see it intuitively lay out. It's very clear for me what someone's business looks like once I've met them and connected with them. And so I was like, yeah, you could do this and this and this. And so I was like, 
I guess this is what I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> so that's how it all came together. <laughs> you know, that, I love the way I'm smiling as you talk because I love what you're describing. Because if we can have more spiritual businesses out there that people are well versed in understanding, uh, ever since I've started doing my podcast last few months, I've gained an increased appreciation of coaching, the power of mentoring, the power of coaching somebody. And I think when you can help others develop their own craft that they're passionate about and make it so that they could be successful with it, then I'd say it's a win-win for everybody. Yeah. So in that part of things, I applaud you. I wanted to ask you about helping 5,000 spiritual entrepreneurs stepping into their role as a new spiritual leader within five years. What made you set that goal and how close to that goal are you at this point? So the, the goal came from inspiration source. It was like super clear. That was the number. I've been working on that number for a couple of years. I'd say I'm about a fifth of the way there now. And I'd laugh and joke about it, but I'm like, I can't do this by myself. Like I could set that goal, but I really need people to step up. And it's such an interesting thing, especially in these times that people know the awakening is happening. They know it, that it's they're a supposed spiritual to renaissance, right? right? That's what right. I call it. I call yeah. it every episode of spiritual renaissance we're experiencing right now. Exactly. And they know it in their gut, but they're afraid. And you so know, should, that's the thing that's holding them back is the fear. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I'll just say this before the pandemic, I feel like the line of work I, cause I started doing the, the open psychic reading, doing the podcast in 2017, 2018. And before the pandemic, I felt like I had to explain to anyone that asked me, what do you do? I'd say, I'm a lawyer. And they're like, oh. And I'd say, yeah, and I'm also a psychic medium. They'll be like, I'll get that look. And then I'll be like, yeah, and I do a podcast. And they'll be like, oh, is your, how's your legal podcast? And I'm like, no, it's a spiritual podcast. They're like, spiritual? Like, no one had a clue. And I had to spend an extra five minutes. I wish I had a t-shirt that said, here's what I have. This is what I do. Don't have to ask, ask me any questions. Here's a site you could click on, and it'll explain it. But now with the pandemic and everything that's happened, I find the inverse is happening. People reach out to me as a psychic medium, and then they'll say, you're a lawyer? You, you, you're lawyering, but you're a psychic medium. So it's like the reverse. And the podcast is, is, is gaining traction. And I think a lot of it has to do with the spiritual awakening we're experiencing right now. And I love it because I think it's going to help our society evolve, get closer together. Maybe we can help to heal these divides we have. I think spirituality could be one of those kind of alternate vehicles we can utilize to get closer together to one another and to kind of look at the larger betterment of everyone. And that's my viewpoint. So I, I want to ask you, what do you think about this spiritual awakening? What do you think is going to be where it winds up? Like what's, mm -hmm. what's your take on it? It's interesting to watch because so I've been doing this now for uh, six years now coming up seven, actually, I guess that I've been in business. Thank you. And doing this. And I, like, again, I love what I do and watching people go through the process and, and you watch the awakening. And I, I basically take my clients through an, another awakening because I'm, I'm helping them step into the role and identity of spiritual leader, because that's what I'm showing them to do. If you want to be a spiritual coach, you, you're basically a leader. So I'm helping them shift their identity. So they go through a whole new awakening. So I'm watching how my clients used to go through that awakening and, and the awakening and then how they're going through it now. And there is an entirely different awareness. And then I'm watching all the clients like circling that aren't quite ready and they aren't quite ready because of the fear level. And they're, it's really about the security of the job, right? So they're like, well, I need to make money. So how am I going to do that? I'm like, well, you need to create your spiritual business that you can create money. And when we're connected to God's source, infinite intelligence, whatever the word is we want to use, then it flows, but it's, it's getting them into alignment with that. So I think if more people could Remember that the fear is only there as basically a catalyst, right? If we're afraid, it's there to push us. It's a tool to get us to move forward so that we can then do the thing we're supposed to do. So I, I think if the people can hear that more and understand that the fear is just there to push them, then that's what they, they need to do. I mean, my second book, it's called Chaos, a Wake, uh, Wake Up Call for Lightworkers, because I wrote it when all this craziness began. It's like, and I'm about to actually rewrite it and republish it to really get it out there is because it's time. Like this chaos is the time for us to step up and, and do what we're supposed to be doing and, and help with that consciousness shift. So I, I see it getting bigger as long as people can get over that fear and use the fear as a tool and a catalyst to really step out. And if we can do that, could you imagine Unlimited light workers? Infinite potential, right? <sighs> I love the word light worker, by the way. I use it all the time. I tell people you're a light worker if I think that someone might be because they bring light to dark. They help people. They're a giving person. Not all heroes wear capes, right? Yeah. So light workers are people like us who work in the spiritual realm to help. 
I feel like decode spiritual concepts for others and simplify things. When I tell people I read energy and that's all I do as a psychic medium, I don't do anything like hocus pocus. I literally just look at energy and tell you what I feel or pick up or sense. And, you know, it is what it is, but some people, you know, they, they have a hard time with their abilities and their gifts. Have you found working with people that you have to actually take time to help them adjust to being comfortable in their own skin? It took me 10 years Yeah. when I had my first, actually 13 years, I should say. So I had to get past some blockages in my head about being a lawyer and then being able to be a psychic and a pot. I I had to get past that myself. So have you had to help people in their own way, get past their own limitations? And if so, what has been your experience with that? What's really interesting is this was a big aha for me last year as I was watching my clients. I I have a core program. It's called Spiritual Biz Bootcamp. And that was a program where like the goal was they were to hit 10K a month or beyond. But like that's where we set the goal. And I would teach them the marketing, but with the spiritual stuff. And it was really cool to watch people. But I would see certain people just soar. Like I would have people make 65 grand in like, I don't know, like 12 weeks. And then I would watch people just not do anything. And so I had to step back and really like go, okay, what, what, what's going on? What, what am I not seeing? And then I realized what the difference was, was that the people that were struggling the most didn't have certainty in their gifts. So they knew they had, I've got to do something. And so they would go, let's create a business, but they didn't have certainty. Confidence in your own ability and separating your ego so it doesn't get in the way when you pick up something, you're like questioning it and you're like, no, I don't think that's accurate. That's not intuition. That's a random thought crossing my mind right now. And my mom, of all people, she's 74. When she was 72, she and I took a trip up to see my brother and my nephew and my niece and, and my sister in law and the family up there. Before, you know, it's like two years ago. We're flying up there and on the flight, my mom's like talking about me. I had headphones on, we're on Jet Blue and I'm listening to whatever I'm listening to and I take my headphones off as we're about to land and my mom says tell this tell this read for her tell her some stuff so i I, of course my mom i humored her i started reading this person (laughs) and we get off the plane i read it for about 15 minutes we get off the plane my mom says to me as we get in the cab everything you just picked up on i picked up on too i guess my whole life i must have been intuitive i just never believed it yeah and i was like can you imagine what she could have done at an earlier age of her life if she just had that confidence to know right that's a big big thing for people yeah, it's, it's huge. It's the thing that I was saying with my clients, that was the thing that held them up. So what I've done is I've actually created a program in front of my core program, which is now really my core program, which is called Spiritual Biz Coaching, where I'm actually certifying people to be a spiritual coach because there's actually no standard out there either. So I'm trying you know, to set a standard. Because when yeah. I first became a psychic medium, I'm like, there is no accreditation for this. There's, it's like, you could have a rough, rough shot, right? You could have unethical psychic, yeah. you can have somebody who's using like a, a pendulum, <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to say like, there's gotta be a standard and there's yeah. gotta be a licensing. Like as an attorney, we're licensed. If you're working on wall street, you're licensed. If you're, or you're credentialed or you have some type of qualifications you have to expect to, to, to go through and experience. And yeah. maybe for psychics, that wouldn't be the worst thing in the world for spiritual people. It wouldn't be the worst idea to have some level of education or some level of credential, some level of ethics, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I've created actually this, I call it the spiritual oath of integrity that I make my clients take when they graduate from the coaching program. Cause it's so important. And all it really, all it really means is that we're being human beings of integrity, where that we are going to act in the same way that we speak. So people say things, but then they're not actually supporting what they say by their, by what they're doing. So when our actions and our words don't, don't match up and that's when we see contrast and everything blows up on our face. So I'm like, how do we set this in motion and get them to see what does it really mean to say that you're a spiritual leader? And so I've created the spiritual oath of integrity and I take that spiritual coaching program and I, I, I'm hoping that their gifts will, that they, they know what the gifts are. And then we're, we work through them and how do you use them and how do you use them to coach somebody and how do you create a program around them? And how did you learn those gifts? Like, where did they come from? So what did you go through to experience to then get here to say, now I have these gifts and this is how I'm going to help my, my, I call it my, your soul tribe, your, your ideal client. So I'm like, how are you going to use that? So I take them through this whole process which again, takes them through a whole no- another level of awakening because I'm making them step up to this level of integrity that if they're not quite there yet, it becomes an interesting um, struggle. <laughs> what has been your greatest challenge working with your clients? Probably the greatest challenge is that when they think they're more awake than they are. And so that's just really fascinating to watch. And so <laughs> to the point where, I mean, I've worked, I don't know, coming up on like 
in in my core programs coming up on like 500 people, not including all the other uh, smaller programs that I have. And so in those core programs, I'm watching people and I actually created my own levels of awakening, having watched so many people go through the process. And there's this, you know, the level ones, they're still asleep. Level two is the beginning awakening, but there's this level three that I call the flight of Icarus. And if you know the, the myth, it's about Icarus was father, they were escaping like somewhere in Greece, I think it was. And the father made him wings, but the wings were made out of feathers and wax. And so the father is very careful, says you can't fly too close to the sun or you can't go in the water because it's all gonna fall apart and you're gonna die. Well, Icarus got the wings and he's like, I'm kind of a badass here. And so he takes off flying around, flies too close to the sun and dies. So I kind of find that with my clients that when they've awakened and then they, they've they read all the stuff and they think that they know, now they're trying to tell you how it is. And it's really interesting to watch. And I go, I just kind of listen. I go, nice try. Nice try. <laughs> and I'm, I'm much older than I look. And so that also throws them off. And I don't really say what my age is, but I'm much older than I look. And so, so that also throws them off. And so I would just listen to them and I'm like, okay, you're in level three. This is a flight of Icarus where you think you know everything, but I can tell you by how long you've been awake and the things you're telling me that you're not quite there yet. And it's weird because I don't want that to sound like a judgment, but it's just the results of what they're doing clearly shows where they are. So I just always look at what's the results. I'm like, if that's the result of what they're saying and doing, then they're they're not as far along as they think. So that's my biggest struggle because when someone thinks they know it all, so they won't listen and they become uncoachable and you can't coach someone that's not coachable. So I try to weed those people out early on, but every now and then one sneaks in. <laughs> I want to ask you about your book. Sure. Are you a spiritual entrepreneur? Can you tell our audience about what motivated you to write your book and tell us a little about it so that they can learn more about you. Yeah. So that book was my first book. And that book is really, really bringing it clear about what is a spiritual entrepreneur? Because when I started this company, I was one of the, and I'm still kind of one of the only people that talks about spirituality and business, how I do into like the, the details that I do. Um, I am unaware of anyone that is is doing exactly how I'm presenting this and, and what all of that looks like with prosperity and everything. And so writing the book was key to get people to realize like, oh, you can make money from your spiritual gifts because the money is just energy, which is your connection with source infinite intelligence. It just brings it in. It's just an energetic flow. There's nothing wrong with that. So the book really breaks down those limiting beliefs that people have that keeps them stuck in the matrix, keeps them stuck in the 3D with their 3D jobs because they think that they can't actually do an energy exchange. That That was my biggest challenge was being able to justify my mind that I work as a lawyer and that this is a gift. And since it's a gift, I used to do it for free for 10 years. So since this is a gift, I can't charge somebody because after all, I'm a lawyer and I, I don't feel right. My best friend I'm working with very closely, her name is Megan. She came and met me at a wedding and she's like, Jason, she did kind of like what you do. She's like, look, you're a psychic. You have a gift. You should charge for your time. If you wrote a letter to someone for one of your legal clients, how much would you charge them? And I was like, X amount. And she's like, well, why is it different if you sit down and consult with somebody and give them a psychic reading? And I'm like, well, I can't because, and then it took six months. And I went from, well, I can't because to I'll see you Saturday at 10 a.m. And I'm going to give 10 people a reading in a weekend. And next thing you know, I have an LLC. I'm going forward and I'm on Groupon and the next, the rest is history like from there. So it's about overcoming your own internal barriers, your own constraints and your own limitations. And it sounds like you're good at helping people get past what haunts them or prevents them. If they say, I can't, it sounds like you say, no, you can. And you will. <laughs> I actually make my clients when I do their first call with them is like an hour and change call where it's a very intuitive where I'm looking at their business and whatever comes to me, we lay out the whole nine yards. And then I go, but before I'm done, I'm like, so are you giving me permission to, to use tough love? I'm like, can I have your permission to do that during, during the program? Because I, I have to, because I'm, I'm not here to just let them be who they are. They, they, who do they have to become to be that spiritual leader? And if you're not it already, or you be the spiritual leader. So that means you have to shift into who that person is. And that's painful. Change that's is right. painful. <laughs> so, well, it's always just, like you have those awkward conversations for a reason because you grow and change from those conversations. Yeah. And it's one of those kind of situations where you could benefit from taking yourself out of your comfort zone and understanding that that's where real improvement occurs. When you're uncomfortable, when you have to hear some criticism, 
when you're not going to be certain about what's the next step and not everything's mapped out and you have to have that entrepreneurial flair in order to get out there and take that risk. And I guess I want to ask you about that as a entrepreneur and then as a spiritual entrepreneur, what do you think spiritual entrepreneurs need to learn from entrepreneurs? That's another big one because I really look at my clients, even though I call them spiritual entrepreneurs, they're not entrepreneurs. Most of them have come from a nine to five or come from, from corporate. And so it's that, that fire that entrepreneurs have, like, there's nothing that will stop me from doing what I need to do. Even if I'm looking at like, at one point I had to fire my entire team. So (laughs) as an entrepreneur, you grow, we crossed the seven figure mark for a couple of years and then things started to wobble. And I had to let everybody go. I had to let them go. I actually fired them, brought the company down and then rebuilt it. So sometimes you have to do that. Or most people who don't have that entrepreneurial like spirit, they would like hang on to the people or they freak out, they go back and get a job. But I'm like, yeah, this is just, this is just a a cycle, right? Entrepreneurs call it a cycle. You build up, you make hell on earth when you're like that. (laughs) When when you're in it. (laughs) During COVID for a few months, I had the really tight, tight, tight financial crunch. And I have to say anyone that goes through that, I give them the fullest respect in the world because you have to have that je ne sais quoi, right? That, Mm -hmm. That particular aspect of when your account is in a negative balance, for example, and you know, you have bills and you know, you do this and that, and you're still pushing ahead because you know that the only thing you can do is push ahead. And you're hoping you push ahead before everything falls out from underneath you. That's the classic (laughs) example of entrepreneurial spirit, right? Yep. And if you can bring in the spiritual part with that, and then just, just knowing that when you're connected to source, and if you follow the, the rules of, of living a prosperous life, that it will always come back. So there's actually no reason to be stressed. It's just part of the cycle. Then you're even better. So spiritual entrepreneurs, I think, can do so much more because we have that spiritual aspect that keeps us centered, keeps us grounded, keeps us connected, and then create these amazing businesses. But there, there is a wobble that happens because they've been a little more ingrained in the 3D than I think they'd care to admit. <laughs> you know, I use 3D as well when I say like the our reality of as we see it without any spirituality in it at all. It's like yeah. 3D. And, and I know a lot of people in our audience understand that term as well. I want to ask you in reference to your work with spiritual entrepreneurs and business owners, what has been the most rewarding aspect of what you're currently doing, helping people develop their business, incubate their businesses, giving them guidance? What do you like the most about all of that? You know, it's interesting. The business part is fun, but the journey is really an inner, inner journey. So when I see a client that's completely different from when they came to me, like that's amazing. That's, that's, and sometimes they may even make the decision at that point that maybe creating a business wasn't what they wanted to do, but now they're a completely different person. Their consciousness has shifted. They see the world differently. They act differently. That to me is like the most rewarding thing. And it was almost an unexpected thing. When I first started the business, it was really about let's get your business going. Like that's what I focus on. And as I've as I've so as I've allowed my rigidness okay. to go to go to the wayside and been more open about it and really focusing on their growth, that's the part that I love to watch. I just love watching the shift. And I'm like, wow, that's a different person. Like I have a client right now who who I talked to her the other day. I'm like, you it's like talking to an entirely different person. And that that's the most rewarding part. Excellent. What do you think is going to be the greatest challenge to spiritual entrepreneurs in the next five years and why? (laughs) I think with everything that's going on in our 3D world that's happening, I think that's our greatest challenge is being able to differentiate between what's happening and what's the reality we see and what's the reality we can create. So that's true for any human being that's awake enough to understand that. So if we can really focus on what can we create versus what's the reality bringing to me and then how, even if the 3D reality that comes to me is creating contrast and distress, how do we transmute those emotions and really take our power back from those emotions? Because I, I believe that we have so much power in our emotions, but it's there for us to harness, not just spew out in anger or spew out in sadness or whatever. It's like that. There's a reason why we have those emotions. And I think there's a lot of power in there. So as spiritual entrepreneurs and just people in general, if we can remember that every little bit of contrast is only there to help us level up, if we can get that down, then everything else becomes easy. And then the spiritual entrepreneurs is, is, is they gain the confidence to step out to really shift. I mean, I don't 
think we can fully comprehend what this world's going to look like in three to five years for so many reasons. And so since we can't comprehend, even if you hear things, these things may freak you out one way or what have you. It's like, no matter what we hear, we have to come back to center and just be like, okay, what is it that I'm creating and how can I be prepared for that? And I don't mean like prepping stuff, which might not be a bad idea, but being prepared psychologically, being wow. prepared spiritually, being prepared emotionally. It is only about the inner work that we have to do so that we can hold steady when the craziness unleashes. <laughs> How about this? How about the fact that our entire planet has gone through a mass pandemic that's really changed everything of how we see the world around us, right? Yeah. We all have major paradigm shifts in terms of what we're going through. And I feel like part of that is going to be to destigmatize mental health issues because I feel like everyone can connect now and say, you know what depression is? I know what that is. It's called 2020 and 2021 when I had to sit in and skip this and skip that, or so-and-so got sick, so-and-so yeah. died, so-and-so lost their job. I mean, I want to ask you about it. Like what, what do you think in terms of mental health awareness and removing stigma role do you think business and spiritual entrepreneurs can take to help that occur? Yeah, I think the spiritual entrepreneurs, as we step out and start to raise the awareness about how we get to control our minds and how we get to, we get to, we get to control our mental health. What's happened in this world is that they put so many things in our environment that have made us weak, essentially. They've made us weak-minded and they've made us weak physically that it's so easy to fall into those mental health places. And so one of the things that my husband's a coach as well. And so one of his big things is he works in a lot of union psychology into the process. So when we have clients that maybe are on medications and things to stabilize various things, he actually works with them to, to find their, their truth in themselves where they are healing themselves so that they don't have to do that anymore and that they can become a whole human beings physically, mentally, emotionally, so that they can handle all of this. And I think that's what spiritual leaders and spiritual entrepreneurs need to do. It's like, how can we help the people who have been stuck in those things? How can we show them that they have control over their mind, their body, their spirit? And there's some, you know, detoxing that has to happen with that, some cleansing of, of the habits that we've created and the things that we might like to do, but that when we get rid of those things that we really can master ourselves. And, and then I think as we learn more how to master ourselves, then we realize that the mental health issues we see today were no one's fault, except for they put so much in our environment that they've created that situation for us, but that we can now see that we're more powerful than that. That's what I love to see. That's a good point. That's a great point. I'm looking at everything we're going through right now, and I'm pretty optimistic and confident about the future. I feel like things are going to even out. Things are going to get better. The pandemic will eventually curtail. I'm not saying we're going to get rid of COVID altogether, but I feel like there'll be enough changes in our society that we'll be able to move forward. And I think when this is all done, that a lot of people are going to have an increased renewal about spirituality in their life, meditation, being mindful having the ability to let go of the past, forgive for the past. I, I want to ask, what's your take on it? Do you think that people will collectively become more enlightened as, as we go through the rest of this pandemic and into the future? I sure hope so. I think, I think we're seeing with the awakening that people are, they are moving that way, but it's weird. I see this very clear divide. I see the people who really aren't awakening and who probably won't. And then I see those that are going through the process and, and, you know, they all have their own role, right? That person has a role and they're not supposed to awaken right now. So that's okay. And so, but the ones who are awakening, I think that group, which I hope grows and grows in numbers every day, and I'm seeing it, I am seeing it happen, but as they grow, I think that's part of what we're here to teach, right? We're here to teach forgiveness and love and, and, and then being in control of our reality and how do we master ourselves. And, and that's what we're here to teach. So that we're really, I think, trying to create a, a better version of the human based off of everything we've been through that contrast right now that we've had that contrast, let's move through that contrast. And then we know what we didn't want. So now we know what we do want. Now, how do we get to what we want and having all the spiritually awakened people help teach that. That's why it's so important for them to take their gifts step out, like do it. I know it's scary as all hell, but man, do we need people right now to step out and be able to coach other an people and guide them. We step need up. an army of light workers, right? We do. We really do need an army of light workers. Like it's, it's, especially even the people who can't even fully awaken, even they need the help in their own way. So like, there's so many people to serve right now. We really need people to step up. 
want to ask you about your other book, Chaos, A Wake-Up Call for Lightworkers. Tell us about that and what prompted you to write that book. Yeah, that book was right when all this craziness started to happen last March, right? Something like that. Yep, a year and a half ago. And it was a download. It was like a complete download. I wrote it in two weeks. It was just like, poof, it just flew out of me. And so it is about everything that's been going on and that contrast and using fear as a catalyst to step out that the chaos that we're experiencing is what we need to step out because we didn't have that contrast. We would been, yeah, we've been, we gotta admit, we've been a little lazy about things, right? We've been a little lazy, a little like life's been really good. And this, this contrast I think was, I don't say needed, but it's here to, to help us shift. So that book, the first half of the book is talking about at that time, everything that I was aware of that was going on. Cause we didn't at that point, didn't know. I just knew the book had to be written and about how to deal with the fear and how to work through things. And the second half of the book is actually how to start to build your business so that you can be in control of your income so that no one can tell you you don't have a job and no one can tell you you have to do something to your body so you can have a job. But how do you create your own job with your own income so that you can be in charge of you? And so that's what the book is. And it's I've just actually this weekend gotten a fresh download. And so I'm going to be rewriting it with a little more umph to it. I was kind of skirting some issues in the first one because we weren't sure, but now I'm sure. So, <laughs> so, the, so the version two will be out there, but it actually probably will not be published in the standard way because I know with the content, they probably wouldn't allow it. So I'll be publishing and distributing my own book through my own my own uh, funnel. So I'll get it out there as many hands as possible. <laughs> Tell us about your podcast. Yeah. Well, the podcast, interestingly enough, my podcast is mostly for me. <laughs> so my, I use my podcast right now. So the podcast is called Becoming a Spiritual Entrepreneur. And the podcast is really where when I get these little downloads, thoughts and pings, that's where I go to record my information. And then I compile it into books. And so that's what I use that podcast for. But I'm in 2022, we'll be launching Prosperity Patterns which will be where I'll interview people. And it's all going to be about how do we shift the patterns in our life and change our habits that we currently have that's blocking our prosperity. So what do we need to do to allow prosperity? And for me, prosperity is being in balance, mind, body, spirit, 3D, 5D, everything. So that includes the flow of money, but that includes being you know, mentally healthy, physically healthy, and, and spiritually healthy in every way so that we're balanced beings. So that prosperity is just like ease and flow and everything is in ease and flow. That I'll be starting in 2022 and interviewing various people about what that looks like for each individual and talking to other spiritual entrepreneurs about making money with their gifts too. I was going to tell you, as you first start talking about your podcast, you're like, well, I just do it for me. <laughs> you start getting into prosperity patterns. And I was like, yeah, you're going to be interviewing a bunch of people. Yeah. You're going to enjoy it. You're going to find a knack for it. And I feel like you'll actually even do a YouTube channel eventually if you haven't had one yet. I feel like you're going to do something like I do with this podcast yeah. where it started off with audio. Then I figured out, oh, wait, I could do this on Zoom and I could put this on my YouTube channel. Right. <laughs> so you're going to have something like that. You're going to spread and you're going to have your own group of people. And I wouldn't even doubt if you have retreats in the future, if you haven't done those yet. I feel like yeah. you're doing retreats as well. Thank 2022, you, yeah. 2023, I feel like it's going to be really busy for you. Very busy. Yeah, that, that podcast will turn into a book. I already am working on the book and, and it'll actually turn into a deck of cards as well. So there's a whole process behind that. Yeah. What's your favorite thing of being an entrepreneur? I think it's just the freedom to create. Yes. Man, it's so much fun to get an idea and go, I can execute this. I mean, it's just, it, I, it's the coolest thing. I love it, it. It's, Right. You're just like, poof, I got it. And then when you're when you've been doing it long enough, you just you don't worry about it. You're like, let's just execute it. I got this great. Actually, it was a week ago, Monday. I kept going like, what's the next thing? What am I what, uh, what am I supposed to be doing? And I got this incredible download a week ago, Monday, to the point where I had to get up in the middle of the night, go. I have an I have a studio where I have an eight foot by four foot whiteboard. And I like laid the whole thing. Oh my out. God, really? Oh yeah. Same. I got the same <laughs> one in my bedroom. I have a whiteboard for my law firm. And when COVID happened, I went and grabbed it. I put two whiteboards in my room and <laughs> that's my dry erase reality right there. Yep. Yep. So I sketched it all out. So I'm going to be hopefully next month launching a, cha a challenge because I think there's so many people who are afraid. They're like, oh, can I have a spiritual business? What does that mean? What does that look like? And so I'm going to be doing a 21 day challenge for anyone who's like, I'm curious. Let's get in there full 21 days where they can actually 
get the information they need to start to get a client if they so choose, like really hit it running and uncovering those limiting beliefs. So I got this download for this challenge that then includes a, a workbook and a, a planner. And it's like, you just go. So like, it's like, I got this idea. And like today, earlier today, I spoke with someone who's like, can print the planner, can print the, the print the, even print the cards when the prosperity book is ready. They can pl- print everything. I'm like, great, that's done. Okay, great. Now I got to audio record my book. That's halfway done. And I got, and so you just go. <laughs> you mentioned cards earlier. Cause I can see people like meditating or reflecting on certain things that you're going to teach them and they'll reflect on it as part of the programming with you. So yeah. I don't know if that's what you're talking about, but I can see you having components of that with multiple different types of reflective type of cards. It's not yeah. just one set that you're working on right now. You have two other ones. Oh, cool. I love it. I'm sure I have, I have so many ideas. I really just need time to execute them all. <laughs> that's a lot. That's, that's the best part of being an entrepreneur though. I have a little book. That's actually- I was going to say, carry your book or use your iPhone and write notes and dictate and all that kind yep. of stuff. I, feel I like- have an idea book. It's only for <laughs> ideas. Like no notes go in there except for an idea. An idea goes in there and then I figure out what order I'm going to execute things in. <laughs> What do you think when people say that if someone's intuitive, that they shouldn't charge for their gift, they should, like I I told you for 10 years, I was stuck in that paradigm. How do you explain to people when they say that? Like, you know, Jason, you, you're a lawyer, my original argument, you're a lawyer, you really shouldn't charge for this. You know, you're helping people. I I, kind of explained my viewpoint on it. I'll ask you what yours is. Sure. So, well, I think there's so many components to that, but the one that usually gets people to go, Oh, is that, is that when First of all, doesn't it feel good to give? Yeah. I mean, right? It feels really good to give. And so when we allow a client to give us energy for what we're giving them, they feel good too. So we're robbing the other person the the satisfaction and the great feeling of giving if we say, no, 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 don't charge. So that's one of the things, like allow that person to enjoy the process of giving. And then, so that's a big piece. And then the other piece is that when someone invests, they really take it to heart and they see changes. So I find like I have my kind of lower ticket programs and even I'll be doing this challenge at a lower ticket price. And most people don't even open the application. They don't do the work because they only invest it a little bit. So if you really want to change someone's life, you have them invest. And so when they invest, they show up. So I have my core programs are 8,000 and 10,000. And so they show up, although I have to say, I do, I have had over the years about a dozen people who paid 10 grand and never showed up. But mostly they show up because they've invested in themselves. They've committed to it. And when they commit, they're there and they get results. And if they're not committed, they spent, you know, $47, $97. They're not going to even look. I mean, we've all done it. I mean, when's the last time you got something for free? Memberships. Right. <laughs> I, I will tell you that for many years before I started work, make, taking fitness seriously, I'd have my little LA fitness thing on my keychain. And I felt like I was working out, even though the reality was if I'd show up at the gym, they'd be like, uh, who are you? Can I see your ID, please? And I'm like, oh my God, this is the new gym. Like we pay for things we don't use. Yeah. And I think a lot of businesses bank on that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Which is, you know, nothing wrong, but what we want, like for me, my whole thing is like, I'm here to help people shift consciousness. So my goal is for my clients to succeed so they can touch more lives. Like that's the whole point. I don't just want your money. I'm like, I know I want you to succeed. So when you start to think about the fact that you're actually charging for your client, because then my client shows up and succeeds versus not showing up. So I'd rather rather not take their you know lower ticket pricing if I can help it, and then have them invest in themselves so they show up because the lower ticket guys, although they get excited and they want it, that's the thing they ask for it. They're like, we need something that's you know less than eight grand. I'm like, all right, but then they don't they don't really do the work and they don't get the results. And so it's it's kind of this I don't know. I just have only recently started offering lower ticket stuff because people were really asking for it, but I wouldn't do it for years because I'm like, I want you to show up. I don't want you to just hand me your money and then never open the program. Program. So they don't oh, yeah. serve anybody, but they keep asking for it. So I'm giving it to them. So hopefully that'll just get more people to get excited about it. But that's uh, yeah, I want them to get the results. That's the whole key. Well, that's the point of teaching, right? And, and, and giving coaching is, is to see your, your students or your mentees yeah. succeed and be happy in their power. And yeah. knowing that you've contributed to that, it's powerful. Yeah. I want to ask you this. How can our audience find you? Because we're you, if you could believe this, we're running low on time. How fast this interview just went? We're good talkers. Yeah, right? <laughs> so, so they can find me. They can go to my website, KimberlyMaska.com, 
or if they're just curious, they also want to like hear more about like these mindset shifts that you need to go through to be able to step out. If you're like, I've been really thinking about starting a business, go to Spiritual Biz Success. That's Spiritual B I Z Success dot com, and the Spiritual Biz Success will take you to a webinar, to a training masterclass where I'm showing you the five shifts that my clients uh, they have to master these shifts, and it's a lot of mindset around that money, about the idea that even like when people don't want to charge and I say, well, but if you charge and you make a hundred thousand or 500,000, think of how much more you can give back. Or right? put so back into your own business and grow yeah. it. Yeah. yeah and grow it more. Larger. Yeah. So I cover all of those things. Those things that people are kind of stuck on are all covered in those shifts. And then at the end of that, if they want to book a call, they can do that at the end of that training. Who has been the most influential figure on you for spirituality and your development? Ooh, that's a really good question. <sighs> I don't know. It's just going to be weird because I don't know if I can say it's, it is spiritual, but it's also psychological and, and doing the inner work of who you are. But Jordan Peterson, if you don't know who the Dr. Jordan Peterson is, he's like phenomenal and he really makes you think. And my husband studies him and, and Jung a lot and brings it into the work that he does, which creeps into the work that I do. And what's really awesome is that we're, what's I think is the coolest thing is we hear the stuff and then we sit and discuss it and really break it down and like, have to do, you have to do the inner work to be able to step out and do what we do. If not, you're out of integrity. And so we're constantly doing that. But Jordan Peterson has a huge influence on us. He's like one of the greatest minds there is and really gets you to what's, think. And it's, he's I amazing. love that. Yeah. I'm going to ask you just out of curiosity, what's it like being married to somebody that does the same line of work as you in spiritual entrepreneurship? It's amazing. It's, it's our people. Well, first of all, women across the board are like, how did you find a man that's spiritual? <laughs> <laughs> gets I, mean, it. I could see where that would be a challenge for people because <laughs> most people have to deal with their partners that don't understand the whole spiritual aspect of things, right? Yes. Yep. So it's funny because we have like the flip side of that where, where most people are like in contention because they don't understand each other from that perspective, but our, I don't say contention, but we're, we like to challenge each other because the whole point is to be the best version. So we don't let each other slide. So it's an interesting dynamic because it's like, I don't know, say you were just talking to a friend and you just flippantly said something that was, I don't know, like silly or just meaningless. My husband will catch me. He's like, why would you say that? I'm like, that's a really good question. I don't have an answer for that. So we're constantly working to level each other up, which is a whole challenge in and of itself, but it's pretty fantastic. (laughs) I love that. I love that. And I actually think that that will help the two of you be very strong together because you both have similar things of how you approach things and look at things. And I think that could strengthen the two of you. Yeah, definitely. Most definitely. Yep. (laughs) Since we're running low on time, I want to ask you, if you were a spirit animal, which spirit animal would you be and why? Oh, probably. Well, you'll see behind me, I have peacocks everywhere. (laughs) So peacocks seem to, well, actually I'll admit the peacock came from my mother, but I think the peacock is about like standing strong. And I'm sure there's a spiritual piece behind this. I don't have all the details about, but how I interpret it. First of all, it also has to do with prosperity and that feeling of wealth and that just feeling of flow. And then they're able to really stand and be recognized which for me is part of what I'm doing is standing up, which is not easy. People think like, oh, you've got this business, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, I'm very vulnerable in having to step out, have these conversations, talk about my life, be out there. So the peacock who has no fear and as part of what they do is spreading their feathers and showing who they are is, a, is an important symbol for me to really step up and stand out and be like, yes, I'm here to be seen and heard. <laughs> yeah, show and tell today. I always say owl. Let me do that right. Oh, nice. Place. I have this crystal owl. I have two of them actually. But my point is, I always say owl is my spiritual animal because I have two parrots. I grew up with a parrot. I like birds. I love birds. And owls are about wisdom and seeing above the, the fray and looking beyond. And so that's why I say owl. Nice. Nice. I love it. I want to thank you for coming on today and sharing your information with our audience. And it's been a breath of fresh air to have you talk about these topics. And, you know, I haven't had any spiritual entrepreneurs on the show in recent times. And I think it's important that we have programming that recognizes the role that you do helping other spiritual individuals who are entrepreneurial, who wish to be entrepreneurial grow. I would never have done my thing if I didn't have my own best friend sitting behind me saying, you need to do this. You need to do this. Like without that, most people probably will say, eh, I'll do it next week. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it next year. And then it never happens. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm glad she did that and got you out there. (laughs) I know. I know. I'm so indebted to her. It's such an amazing thing to see what you're doing. And I believe you will meet your 5,000 spiritual entrepreneurs uh, within five years. Excellent. I just want to thank Kimberly for coming on the show today. It's great to have somebody talk 
about their passion in such a way where you could tell that they love what they do. And you could also tell that they do a lot, which has great impact on others. And so talking to Kimberly today made me realize we have a need for spiritual business coaches. We have a need for spiritual entrepreneurs. With the spiritual awakening that's happening right now and everything post-COVID, I feel like there's so much of a value for anyone wanting to get involved in this area. I guess it would mean recognizing your own ability, your own talents, having confidence in yourself, but then also being willing to take risks, not having fear of failure or rejection, and staying in your own light. I believe a lot of us can do this. You can do this. You can be a spiritual entrepreneur and you can be successful at it. If anyone's interested in wanting to learn more about this entire topic, I highly suggest reaching out to Kimberly directly at KimberlyMosca.com as well as SpiritualBizSuccess.com. The information is going to be posted in the show notes, and I highly recommend you check out Kimberly's information, check out her website, check out her podcast and her books that we've mentioned. That'll be in the show notes as well. It takes a lot of courage to step out of the light, step out of your comfort zone and let others know that this is what you're about, this is what you're passionate about, and this is what you believe in. And that's why I thank Kimberly so much for you utilizing that and being able to come on our show today. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. Stay positive. When you're positive, anything's possible. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Social Psychic Radio Show. Don't forget to join us for another episode next time. If you enjoyed the show, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give us a review on iTunes. You can also check us out on Facebook. And don't forget to visit the Social Psychic YouTube channel. Until next time, it's a big world out there. Keep an open mind, embrace your paradigms, and know that the universe is always yours to explore.